Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the capacity model and what I think is the biggest puzzle in all of the study of nuclear proliferation. We're transitioning from our unit on how you build nuclear weapons to explanations and theories for why countries actually do it in practice. And this capacity model lecture is a useful transition between those two subjects. That's because the capacity model makes a very basic prediction on who develops nuclear weapons. Namely, states that can build nuclear weapons are the ones that build nuclear weapons. It's a simple yes, no. Can you build nuclear weapons? If the answer is yes, then you do it. If the answer is no, you cannot, then you do not. Diving a little bit deeper into the theory, there are three main points to cover. The first is obvious. You cannot build a nuclear weapon if you do not know how to build a nuclear weapon. The other two components are less obvious, and it's part of the reason why we spent time learning about how to build nuclear weapons. For one, you need the ability to produce precise machinery that is not directly involved in a nuclear reaction, but is what allows you to access that nuclear reaction. And the final component is that you need the infrastructure to be able to produce that sort of machinery. Absent these three things, you can't really build a nuclear weapon. Let's put a little bit more context on each of those points. To begin, think about why countries did not develop nuclear weapons during World War I. Well, the answer here is obvious. No one knew how to do it. We needed advances in physics to be able to understand how to control the atom. And during that interwar period between World War I and World War II, physicists made those developments. And as a consequence, we had a race to develop the bomb during World War II and not during World War I. Of course, in the modern era, nuclear weapons are a bit of an open secret. Despite that, we still don't have very many countries rushing to build them. One of the main reasons why that's the case is that even if you know, in principle, all of the basics of how to develop a nuclear weapon, actually doing each of those steps in practice is difficult. Take the uranium centrifuges on the left as an example. Recall back to how these things work. They spin around very, very fast. And when you put uranium in there, it starts separating the 235 from the 238. That's because the 235 is slightly lighter than the 238. So at a very slow rate, the 235 will start concentrating on the inside and the 238 will start concentrating on the outside. You can separate the fissile material from the non-fissile material. But to actually make good progress on that, you have to spin these things extremely fast for a very long amount of time. Imagine that you have a machine manufacturer that is not particularly precise. Well, when you start accelerating these centrifuges, they're gonna come off of their hinges and become projectile weapons themselves. So even if you know what I just told you, how to separate 235 from 238 using a centrifuge, actually doing that in practice is very difficult. On the right, we have the Yongbyon Plutonium Reprocessing Facility in North Korea. It's a similar sort of story going on there. Plutonium reprocessing works by taking spent uranium from a reactor and separating out the plutonium-239 with a chemical process. To do that, though, you still have to manufacture a nuclear reactor, and you still have to master the chemical procedure that separates the plutonium from everything else. Again, if you know in principle how this works, that does not get you very far in actually doing it. Then there's the infrastructure part. This is Clinton Engineer Works in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It's the same town with the National Laboratory. During World War II, the Manhattan Project used this facility to enrich the uranium for the Hiroshima bomb. And during that time of uranium enrichment, Clinton Engineer Works was using just under 1% of all of the electricity in the United States at the time. To be clear, as time has progressed, we've gotten more efficient in how to enrich uranium. Those centrifuges that we've seen before did not exist back then. This is a more recent creation. So as time progresses, it is costing less and less electricity to produce enriched uranium, 
but nevertheless, it can put immense strain on a country's infrastructure. Putting all this together, the capacity model makes a solid prediction about the first five countries to develop nuclear weapons. The United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, and China. These are the major powers. It stands to reason that they have the best ability to produce the manufacturing necessary to withstand the infrastructure constraints to build a nuclear weapon. And it's around this time that future President John F. Kennedy is airing his concerns about the development of nuclear weapons in other countries. These technical barriers are going down, and if the capacity model is right, that countries that can build nuclear weapons will build nuclear weapons, then you can see why perhaps 10, 15, or 20 countries will develop nuclear weapons by 1964. As we know, Kennedy's prediction was wrong. But this map shows that his premises were spot on. In fact, this map is estimated latent nuclear capabilities as of 2001. White and yellow countries have the least capacity, whereas orange and ultimately red countries have the most capacity. I created this data along with a co-author. Basically what we're doing is taking observable features of a country and aggregating them into a single dimension of nuclear capacity. So we're looking at things like what sort of manufacturing technologies do these countries have? What do their scientists know? What sort of civilian nuclear projects are they engaged in? And so forth. And we can take all of that information and aggregate it into a single measurement. So this is basically giving you a rough proxy on how easily a country can develop nuclear weapons. I want you to focus in on North Korea. It's got a yellowish, orangish tint to it. That means it's more capable than, say, most of Africa, but it's less capable than Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, Japan, South Korea, basically all of Europe. And this is in 2001, just five years before North Korea developed a nuclear weapon. This is giving us strong evidence that it's not the ability to build nuclear weapons that's keeping countries from doing this. To hammer that point home, I want you to take a look at this figure. On the horizontal axis, we have year. On the vertical axis, we have a count of the number of countries. The light blue line is the number of countries that actually have nuclear weapons. You can see that it's trickling up over time for the most part, with the one exception of South Africa causing it to drop down at the end. The dark blue line is the estimated number of countries that could develop nuclear weapons using North Korea in 2001 as a barometer. You can see that there's shadowing around the dark blue line to represent uncertainty. This is an estimate of nuclear capabilities, so we're not certain that the dark blue line actually represents the truth. The shadowing around it leaves a margin of error. But the key takeaway is that we see a gap. In the early parts of time, there wasn't very much of a difference between the number of countries that had nuclear weapons and the countries that could develop nuclear weapons. But once you pass 1960 and head into the 70s and 80s and 90s, you start seeing a large gap between countries that could build nuclear weapons and countries that have built nuclear weapons. And this figure, for my money, is the most important figure in the study of nuclear weapons. This is a huge puzzle. Why is it that we have so many countries that could develop nuclear weapons but have not? This figure is actually coming directly from my book, Bargaining Over the Bomb. But I'm not the first person to talk about this. This is well known in the literature on nuclear proliferation. However you want to measure capacity, and however you're measuring the exact timing of the development of nuclear weapons, you're going to see a large gap like this. And our big goal in understanding why countries develop nuclear weapons is explaining the gap. Because the gap is not a consequence of ability. That is exactly what this figure is illustrating. The ability to produce nuclear weapons is pretty widespread, but the countries that actually have nuclear weapons are not. And thinking about North Korea again, the gap makes sense. This is a nighttime satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula. The biggest concentration of lights is around Seoul and surrounding regions. And then just north of that, you can see a line that's running across the entire peninsula. That is the demilitarized zone, the border between South Korea and North Korea. North of that, though, you essentially have a void. The only thing you can really see in North Korea, that single source of light, is Pyongyang. That's it. 
a country that is barely capable of lighting itself has developed nuclear weapons. And once you internalize that idea, it becomes clear that the reason that only 10 countries have developed nuclear weapons is not a story about capacity. Obviously, lots more countries could. Something else is going on here. That's not to say that the international community does not care about capacity. They do. In fact, in more recent years, there's been a focus on trying to restrict access to enrichment and reprocessing technologies, or ENR for short. That is, for example, uranium centrifuges or chemical plutonium reprocessing facilities. The idea here is that if you cut off access to fuel for a nuclear weapon, you can't develop a nuclear weapon. This is a map of countries that have had enrichment or reprocessing facilities at some point. And there are a lot of takeaways here. First, you'll notice that there are fewer countries with this technology than countries that the previous map deemed were capable of producing nuclear weapons. But even with that, if you're thinking about a more restrictive definition of ability to produce nuclear weapons based off of having facilities that can fuel a nuclear bomb, there is still a gap. You can still see countries like Canada, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, Japan, South Korea. All of those countries have or have had enrichment and reprocessing facilities, and yet nevertheless did not build a nuclear weapon. With that being said, this map is underestimating the number of countries that could develop nuclear weapons, because it stands to reason that there are countries out there that could develop enrichment and reprocessing technology, but simply don't because they don't have any need to construct nuclear weapons, and if they have nuclear power plants, they could perhaps buy the fuel for nuclear power plants from one of these other countries that is highlighted. With that in mind, this map is showing, to some degree, a success of the international community and the nonproliferation regime. There are countries out there that could, in theory, be building these things, but the international community is trying to stop that from happening, which is, in the long term, in theory, reducing rates of proliferation overall. The international community wasn't always so good about restricting access to ENR technology. In fact, the Soviet Union helped out China with ENR. Then China helped out Algeria, Iran, and Pakistan. Pakistan, and more specifically, the AQ Khan Black Market Network, helped out Libya, Iran, and North Korea. France, the all-time king of ENR sharing, helped out Israel, Japan, Pakistan, Taiwan, and Egypt. And then in a couple of smaller cases, West Germany helped out Brazil, and Italy helped out Iraq. But like I said, over time, beliefs in how to restrict proliferation came to think about ENR technology as being the big barrier. And so, as I've mentioned before, the IAEA under Mohamed al Baradei's administration worked very hard to reduce those sorts of technologies worldwide, and in particular, tried to crack down on that AQCon network. In any case, I want to focus back in on this gap. This is what we're going to be geared toward trying to understand in this unit and in the next unit. Why is it that we have lots of countries that can build nuclear weapons, but don't build nuclear weapons? And if you join me next time, we'll start to get to other answers. Hope you enjoy this and hope to see you then. Take care.